nothing can be described in the unknown without using metaphors of the familiar. Mm -hmm. And the mind is a, is a good example of how we have changed our metaphors where uh, Freud did the plumbing system, the pipes and the valves and the faucet and things got dammed up and jammed up and you had to release them and all that. And then we switched to the telephone network when we invented the telephone systems. And then we went to uh, computers and holographic cameras, and now we're in parallel processors. So we take our latest invention, and we forget that we copy nature and project those inventions onto our natural selves and the whole universe. But in the field of biology, it seems as if some of the leading writers and spokesmen are adamant about hanging on to this mechanistic worldview. I'm, I'm thinking of particularly Richard Dawkins and his mm -hmm. book, which has gotten so much attention, The, the Blind Watchmaker, that yes. this, this is God as a blind mm -hmm. watchmaker, and, and we're all the watches. <laughs> Well, I think the reason for that is that because physics was considered the, the, the king science, the regal science, all others had to try to fit themselves into that mold of mechanical physics. Well, the odd thing is that for half a century at least, physics has gotten beyond that mechanical mode, but biologists are still following it. Mm -hmm. So they still think in reductionistic mechanical terms. And uh, that's why you, you get that kind of biology. Now, I've uh, even, I believe, taken us beyond Darwin. If you look at the last 50 years of research, you find a very different pattern when the, the logic of organism is simply different from that of mechanism. And we now have, for example, a half a century of evidence in the laboratory that DNA rearranges itself intelligently when an organism is stressed and that evolution actually, uh, life is too intelligent to proceed by accident, I like to say. And the genetic accidents, which of course do occur, are quite rapidly repaired. This, uh, this now reflects itself, for instance, in genetic engineering, where plants and animals often reject implanted genes the way our bodies do implanted organs. And uh, so it doesn't work as well as the engineers would like it to. But we're learning now that we live in an intelligent universe, in an alive universe, and my biology revisioned book with, with Willis, of course, addressed that question, what if we made the assumption that consciousness was the source of all evolution rather than a late product mm -hmm. of evolution? Well, that's an idea that's consistent with spiritual teachings uh, of the world's cultures. Um, and it raises a, a big issue for, for starters for me it raises uh, I'd like to distinguish between consciousness and intelligence when mm -hmm. when a an organism can somehow intelligently uh, repair damage to to its genes I, I suspect that that's not conscious in the sense that we are conscious no and that of course is a big problem in the field of consciousness is yeah. that each of us has our own view of what it is and mm -hmm. our definitions and it's clear that consciousness is not the same across the board you wouldn't expect universal consciousness cosmic consciousness god consciousness to have the same consciousness as you and i do or as an ant does or as a tree does so we have um, I like to think of it, as Ed Mitchell also does, as a learning universe. Mm -hmm. If um, you remember Alan Watts' uh, The Book, yes. which I think is as timely today as ever, his little story saying the universe is God playing hide-and-go-seek with himself yes. because God is everything, no one to play with when you're every. The book no, about no. the taboo against knowing who you are yes, is the full yes, title, as I yes. recall. The idea is that, that the universe is God playing hide-and-go-seek with himself, was mm -hmm. the story he gave children. I like that. And mm -hmm. uh, he says, why would he play hide-and-go-seek with himself? There's no one to play with when you're everything. Yeah. So he has to hide in the rocks, in the trees, in you and in me, and the game is to find ourselves. So I'm always looking for a complete worldview, a, a coherent one that will include physics and biology and spirituality in a single living universe. Mm -hmm. So you're suggesting that consciousness, rather than being sort of the end product of evolution, is the beginning. Yes. 
mm -hmm. that we start with. Consciousness is the best word we come up with at present for mm -hmm. what the Greeks called the plenum, the fullness of potential, what David Bohm called the implicate order. Um, there have been many names for it, the ether, nowadays it's zero-point energy. And it's, it's the recognition that there is an intelligent, aware source playing itself out by creating material worlds such as our own. Uh, one of my friends calls this the leading, the creative edge of God. Mm -hmm. Humans within this planet now are the newest experience of the universe in what biologically always seems to come down to cycles of unity to individuation through which arises conflict, negotiations happen, cooperation is arrived at, and we go to unity again at the next higher level. Mm -hmm. And that's why the story of evolution is so important today to help us understand where humanity is and what is our next step? And we're right between that competition to cooperation mm -hmm. phase. Yeah. Well, I, if I may probe with you about consciousness a little further, yes. it's been my passion for mm. decades. I'm mm -hmm. fascinated by consciousness in all of its dimensions. And I, I struggle with uh, the issue about consciousness and biology and consciousness and evolution because it seems to me that uh, as wonderful and vast as consciousness is, that the body itself has an intelligence of its own that is much larger than the conscious mind. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think our, our cells have a better handle on uh, past, present, future than we do in mm -hmm. our minds. They're in the spiritual traditions, it's always been understood that linear time is, is an artificial concept that we've imposed on the world for practical reasons of ordering our lives but that the reality, the deep reality of the universe is an eternal now in which everything is there. Now, today physics is showing us a non-local universe in which no information is ever lost. So we're getting confirmation of the old spiritual traditions understanding that the universe exists as a totality in a non-time space sense and then we string out individual lives and experiences, mm -hmm. including the entire course of material evolution mm -hmm. as we understand mm -hmm. it. So God can only think, if you like, this, this basic God consciousness can only think about things that have been in the experience of the cosmos. That's why we're the creative edge of God, mm. having the newest experiences that add into the total consciousness of the universe. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, at the beginning, it was something simpler than it is now. Mm -hmm. And it plays itself out in some organisms, such as bacteria or ants or trees, in a less complex way than it does in our minds. Mm -hmm. But our human minds, in a sense, are the first to pretend a disconnect from the rest of universal consciousness. Mm. And that was our, our mission of doing objective science. Oh, here are we, yeah. here is the material world. Uh -huh. And we have this interesting ability to make that pretense, mm. to, to forget that this is a participatory oh, universe that yeah. we're co-creating, mm -hmm. and pretend that we can look mm -hmm. at it from a distance. That's a new game.